Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, thanks for your patience while we deal with the IT issues. I was asked to talk about uh, Berkshire Gray, and, um, and I'm, I'm really delighted to do that. It is a little different from my usual, I'll say, goals. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you the story of Berkshire Gray. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own story. I'm going to show you some videos. I, I can't figure out how to do all of this without it seeming promotional, and I don't like giving a promotional talk at an academic institution. Uh, so you'll just have to forgive me for that, and, uh, and, and we'll go with it. This, uh, I'm going to start by showing you a video of a Berkshire Gray system so you have a clue what we're talking about as we go forward. So this will give us something concrete. And uh, you probably can't hear that audio, which is not a bad thing necessarily. Here, I'll lean in. Can you hear that? That's the Berkshire Gray music. So <clears throat> we're going to look at this video and then we're going to look at it again slowly because it's impossible to take it in at this speed. Okay, so that is a, uh, a Berkshire Gray installation at, uh, at a FedEx ground uh, distribution center and a shipping center. So uh, let's look at it again, only I'm going to uh, focus in on a few points. So what you have on the right side here, these are uh, a row of bins, and there's actually three of these rows. There's another row behind it, and then there's another row over there. And um, and then at the left side, what you have is a picking cell, a pick cell. That's a robot that does the picking up of the things and inducting them into the system. So uh, let's scoot forward a little bit. And there's a plan view of this. So that's her dumping a bag of stuff. And, and there's the plan view. So can you see that? Wow, this is a challenge. <laughs> okay, we're just going to... Skip that part, you can't see the plan view there. Uh, can you see the robot picking? Yes. Okay, so it's picking a lot of things. A lot of them are flat, but there's a big variety of things. It could be a tube, it could be a, a, a plastic bag. It has to be able to handle all those things with just one gripper. And it's dropping it into a vertical scan tunnel. So uh, the brand name for that is Hyperscanner. Uh, it's got a whole lot of lights and a whole lot of cameras, and so no matter what angle the thing goes through at, no matter what its attitude, it gets a scan. Uh, so now that it's identified the object, it goes up these conveyors and it goes to one of these, uh, what it's called linear sort wings. So that is a shuttle that zips back and forth between two rows of bags, and, uh, and it'll drop it in the right bag and then when that bag is later loaded onto a truck, that's how, you know, that's how stuff gets to the right place. Um, so that's the, uh, I don't know, is that, is that clear enough? Am I missing anything that, hey. Um, 
So let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, so that's just to give you at least some concrete reference for what I'm talking about. Uh, and we'll come back and look at some other systems, but uh, I think what I want to do is uh, first talk, tell you just a little bit about my story, which uh, uh, Seth totally spoiled, but then, you know, he oversold, so <laughs> forget what he said. Um, and then we'll uh, back up a little bit and look at the Berkshire Gray story, and then we'll look at the vision behind uh, Berkshire Gray, and then my favorite thing is manipulation, so we're going to talk a little bit about the manipulation, and we'll look at some more systems. Okay, that's, that's the plan. So, <clears throat> yeah, my start. Oh, and by the way, I was actually here a couple of years ago, and I, I'm sorry, some of you are going to see some slides that you've seen before, but not very many, I promise. Uh, I think I have to show them anyway. Anyway, the, uh, so, yeah, my story before Berkshire Gray, it was just about manipulation. It's the only thing I've worked on pretty much my whole life. And uh, I, I just love manipulation. I started out working in compliant control. This was a figure from my... <laughs> <laughs> Turn down the brightness. That's a good idea. I can do it on my computer. Holy moly. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't see it. It's too dark. But <laughs> yeah, that was, my, that was my master's thesis, and it is still the most cited thing I've ever done. And <laughs> so, you know, it's a curse. Whatever you do, whatever you do, my whole life I've been trying to live up to that and failing. Um, that is a textbook that I wrote on the mechanics of manipulation. And uh, so that's, that's my thing. I'm interested in the physics of manipulation and how that ties into you know, estimating the state of, an, of a manipulation system and doing automatic planning and control and all that stuff. So that's my thing, manipulation. Uh, you might uh, suddenly think to yourself, wait a second. <laughs> not part of the story is either business or logistics. And this is a talk about the logistics business. Okay, that's awkward. Uh, even more awkward is I'm doing this at Georgia Tech and Georgia Tech is the seat of a great deal of expertise in logistics and, and business. Okay, so uh, it's terrifying, but nonetheless, I agreed to do it so that I'm stuck. Um, I don't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about logistics. I know a little bit more now. Here's the thing, I had a crutch. Whenever I needed to know something about logistics, I, uh, I went online, I did a search, I found a free textbook, uh, Warehouse and Distribution Science, okay, authorship, Bartholdi and Hackman, Georgia Institute of Technology. So, perfect, what luck. I can, I can pander to the Georgia Tech audience. And at the same time, it's absolutely true. This, is, this was my go-to reference when I needed to learn about logistics. Um, and I, I, I recommend it. Anyway, so back to my story. Uh, there I was doing robotic manipulation, ignoring everything else, mostly ignoring commerce, commercial stuff. Um, now, you know, there's always been a lot of talk about commercial applications of robotics and including autonomous manipulation. And let me emphasize the word autonomous. If we're talking about just autonomous manipulation, there aren't a lot of uh, significant applications of it. And uh, so one very, very significant one is automated manufacturing. And that has been a tremendous success and has been very important, important to the growth of robotic manipulation. Uh, but there aren't others like that, really. And, uh, and then when people would say, well, you know, we're going to have robots in our home, stuff like that, I was a skeptic. Um, and so I just made a list of the different visions that people had of, of how autonomous manipulation would be a thing. Um, automated manufacturing, yes, absolutely. Bill Gates wrote an article that was in the Scientific American about 10 or 15 years ago in which he said, hey, we're all going to have robots in our basements folding laundry. Okay, I don't know about you. To me, that sounds not likely to happen soon. Someday, maybe, I don't know. But uh, 
Others, I mean, there, there, there's just, you know, if you really look for it, there's a million. You know, of course, we're all going to have home butlers. We're all going to have home maids. It's going to be the Jetsons. Beer delivery was even one. That was a good one that came out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, vacuuming. Oh, wait a second. That one worked. Okay, <laughs> that one is real. And um, uh, some people don't think that's manipulation, but I think it's manipulation. It's, you know, it's getting the dirt and putting it somewhere else. So uh, that was a good one, Roomba. I robot, but with that exception, I think my skepticism has been uh, amply uh, justified. Uh, maybe the biggest one, you know, several years ago, Google acquired a whole lot of robotics companies, uh, made a big splash. We all wondered what was their vision. You know, we would look at the specific companies and try and speculate. You know, what did Andy Rubin, that was the guy uh, who uh, did it, and. Um, we all wondered what the vision is, and we're still wondering. I, there was never an answer, okay? And so, at least as far as I know, does anybody? Okay, so, uh, so there I was. I was a skeptic. Now, what happened was, um, on May 6, 2014, at 10 a.m., I was the skeptic that you're, you're hearing right now. And then two hours later, I was a believer. And I know the exact timing of this. I went back and looked at my calendar. So this is my calendar for May 6, 2014. And there's this two-hour slot here marked Hold for Tom Wagner. And uh, Tom Wagner, I, I, I knew him just a little bit. He had been a DARPA program manager, and then he was the CTO at iRobot. And uh, you know, here's what happened. Uh, and I'm sorry about this. This is like a bit grandiose or blasphemous, OK? If you know the Christian stories, you will recognize this. This is God up in the clouds, and this is, is it St. Peter on the road to Damascus? St. Paul? St. Paul on the road to Damascus, and he has a brilliant epiphany and, and receives the word of God, and then goes on to convert, you know, millions of, of, of Christians. Um, and this is the way I felt in the space of two hours. I went from a total skeptic to a, a total believer. And, uh, and now, here am I <laughs> bringing, bringing the word to you. If this makes you nervous, OK, I, I, I promise uh, we're not going to pass around pledge cards, no collection plates, OK? You're, you're, you're safe. And I, and I do apologize for the blasphemy. I shouldn't do it, but I just wanted to show off my, my art, my art skills there. Okay, so that, that's my story. Um, you know, mechanics of manipulation uh, right up until that epiphany event. So uh, we're going to go back a couple of years. So that was 2014. We're going to go back to 2012. And I'm going to tell you the Berkshire Gray story starting from 2012. And so what happened was Tom Wagner, uh, he left his job at iRobot, and he went on what I think can only be called a vision quest. And there's a nice blog about it on the Berkshire Gray website. He filled a whiteboard with 45 ideas. And he was looking for you know, the right opportunity, an idea where there is, uh, and I'm wandering into business land now, so you know, you'll have to translate this into meaningful words if, if you can. He was looking for a place where you know, uh, market demands, opportunities, whatever, uh, not that they overlap with existing technology, but, but where you could in, imagine that with market trends, and if you push the technology in the right way, that overlap could be brought into place. And what technology was he looking at? He was looking at robotics, but not just robotics. He was looking at machine learning, computer vision. He was looking at a lot of things. And then what uh, other commercial opportunities I don't even know. I mean, he told me one or two, and some of them were pretty crazy. So, you know, 45 ideas in the whiteboard, and then starts narrowing it down and pushing it and, and looking for the right one. Uh, he came up with it, started a group uh, in Boston. Uh, at the time of the epiphany, there were three people in the company. Um, uh, that epiphany happened. He opened a Pittsburgh office and recruited some more. So r right away there, in 2014, we had some more like 20 people or so. Um, split between Boston and, and Pittsburgh. 
we were in stealth mode for a very long time. Uh, people that knew the company had a pretty good guess of what we were doing, but I don't think very many people really knew. And uh, uh, so we stayed in stealth mode until 2018. And then three years later, uh, we're listed on, on the uh, NASDAQ. And I should show you a video or a picture here of the bell ringing ceremony, but no, there's no real bell at NASDAQ. I didn't know this. I, I thought I was going to see people trading. I thought I was going to see people yelling at each other and waving slips of paper in the air. And did I mention I don't know anything about business? OK, yeah. <laughs> but it was a great, actually, it was a great event, though. We had a really great time in New York. It was just a few weeks ago. Um, I was talking to a friend. I was talking to Oliver Brock. Uh, about all of this, and he said, you know, that's the first robotics IPO since iRobot. This was a complete shock to me, and I don't think anybody in the company, I, maybe they had, I don't know if anybody had figured that out. Uh, it's kind of startling that over a period of 15 years, there hadn't been another IPO in robotics. Um, the valuation of the company at the time, uh, just before we went public, was $2.2 billion. That's that was the number that's in some of the filings with the SEC. Um, so that's a big number. If, if you compare with recent acquisitions and valuations, that's a, that's a big number in the robotics area. If you compare with things like, uh, well, there are other things where maybe that number's not so remarkable. Anyway, I mean, that's all I'm gonna say about, about the, 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 the timeline. If anybody has any questions about any of that, I, you know, I can tolerate interruptions. Uh, yeah, Charlie. Can you give any insight into this epiphany? I mean, those two hours, I am fascinated. I will do it. <laughs> this, is, this is it. Thank you. He is not a shill. I've never seen him before in my life. No, actually, we are, we are friends, but <laughs> thanks. So what was the vision that, uh, that Wagner brought to me? And the vision is warehouse automation. OK, wait a second. I'm sure to, to most of you that's like, wait a second. That, that can't be a surprise. Well, you know, that, what is that, seven years ago, eight years ago, actually, it was a surprise that that could be a big application of robotics. Uh, you know, and can it be as big as automated manufacturing? I think it can. Uh, I certainly didn't ha think it could be until this meeting with with Wagner. Uh, and why is that? Let me just remind you of what was happening at the time. Uh, there had recently been a company called Kiva, which had developed a really cool warehouse automation system. They have these little robots that uh, go under the shelves, and they pick up the shelves, and they move the shelves to the humans who pick the order out of the shelves. And it was a brilliant system, and I saw that, and I thought, oh, wow. Somebody solved warehouse automation. You know, I wish I'd thought of that. Uh, well, warehouse automation is now a solved problem. You know, I'll go think of other things. It's not quite that simple because the Kiva system raised the question of, you know, why do we have to have humans still doing the picking? Uh, but look to me like uh, Kiva had the inside track on that because all they had to do is you know, install one robot that can only do the simplest things and then send all the easy pieces to that robot, okay, and then gradually, incrementally, uh, you know, improve the capabilities of the robot. And, um, and I, you know, I don't see how I fit into that. I don't know how they need me. I don't know why I need to work on that. So, you know, I, I put it aside. I wasn't thinking about warehouse automation. Now, I really had the wrong idea, and I know some other people uh, who, who had a similar wrong idea. Okay, that was way, way off base. Uh, but Kiva was a huge success, and is, okay? So Kiva was acquired by Amazon, and so when you're looking at videos of Amazon warehouse automation, you're, you're looking, uh, at least some of it, the moving shelves thing, you're looking at Kiva systems uh, originally. Okay, so, uh, um, so it's not small, it's not salt, um, warehouses, uh, it turns out, even after Kiva, very few of them are automated, especially if they're not owned by Amazon, <laughs> okay. Um, the labor spent in warehouses is actually very high. Uh, picking in warehouses is almost entirely manual, and that's still the case, okay. And um, 
I'm going to give you a few numbers to go with some of this. Uh, and there's uh, an important trend, which is, as you know, e-commerce is actually shifting labor from consumers to warehouses. Okay, so used to be somehow they had tricked the consumer <laughs> into doing all the work, right? You would go to the store and pick things off shelves, put them in the cart, wheel the cart up to the cash register, et cetera, et cetera, right? When you do, uh, uh, when you use uh, Amazon or any e-commerce site, uh, you're shifting that work to shoppers that uh, work in the warehouse or in the stores. Um, and a third element here is that uh, the competitive pressure on retail because of this phenomenon is extraordinary. Uh, if, if you don't have a plan in place, if you're a major retailer and you don't have a plan in place addressing warehouse automation, your investors are going to lose faith in you. Your stockholders are going to lose faith in you. And they all know this. And they view warehouse automation as an, as an existential issue. So uh, that is what, uh, part of what Wagner explained to me. And uh, I do have some numbers to go with some of this. The, uh, there's the sources down here for this information. But I got all this information off of Wagner's in investors presentation which is part of the filings with the SEC. And you know, if you want to look at that kind of stuff, I think it's interesting. You can find it online. Okay? Uh, so you can find Wagner's whole presentation as part of, uh, of, part of our going public. But <clears throat> here's the key numbers. There's this thing they call a total addressable market, which I believe means everything that we could conceivably get a piece of to sell stuff. And uh, where does that figure, 280 billion a year, where does that come from? Well, the total spend in warehouse labor is somewhere around $230 billion a year, okay? There's an additional $56 billion a year spent on materials handling equipment. And so, you know, we should be able to get a piece of that. And then there's gonna be more equipment sold uh, to address that. And so that's, that's uh, some of the numbers that go with the vision. Uh, this did not come from the uh, Wagner. In fact, I found this myself because I wanted to show how dramatically e-commerce was taking over. And the startling thing about this chart is that it looks like e-commerce is actually quite small. And so how can that be? This thing that has been such a disruptive influence in retail and in all of our lives so far, it's not even 20% of retail, OK? It's just getting started. We're still at the beginning. And so this is another important part of the story, right? If it takes you seven years from conception to market, you know, you might imagine e-commerce is going to be over, that you're going to miss the whole thing. But uh, we have a long, long ride in front of us. Yeah? So oh, it's $15 an hour. You're the first person that's ever asked that question. <laughs> uh, that is a great question. And, um, and it's a question everybody working in automation uh, has to think about. There's, um, uh, there's an interesting thing. So one thing is what, what this says is that there's a, a constant growth in the demand for that labor. And you see this at the warehouses. So the number of people working in the warehouse has been going up and up. The number of people who want to work in the warehouses has not been going up and up. Okay, so it's a real challenge uh, for them to get those people. And there's a tremendous turnover rate. Um, so there is, as far as I know, nobody has ever been laid off uh, from installation of automation. And you can say that's a little bit of a dodge. There are people that we would, they would have hired and didn't hire. Uh, so you know, it's not a simple, there's no simple answer to it. Um, but I do think that the, uh, the phenomenon that, that, that you're worried about, and I'm worried about too, 
is probably overwhelmed by, by this trend. The other thing I would say is, uh, you know, these things do cause uh, pain, and, uh, and that was true of the agricultural revolution, and it was true of several industrial revolutions. And going in, you might wonder whether that's really what you want to do. Coming out of it, nobody ever says we shouldn't have done that. Right. Nobody ever says, why don't we send 80% of the population, or I'm just making the number up, I don't even know how it is. <laughs> why don't we send everybody back to the farms, you know, get rid of the tractors and all that stuff. Nobody wants to do that. Um, so those are the things that I tell myself. When I want to worry about it, the thing I worry about is specific locations. So one thing that happens is that uh, you have an area that's hard hit by an economic trend like... Uh, I know there was a lot of uh, manufacturing and furniture going on in North Carolina. A lot of those people lost their jobs when that manufacturing shifted to China. Uh, warehouses uh, look for areas like that where there will be plentiful labor and build warehouses there. And I mean, I don't know for sure. I don't know if they are building them in North Carolina or not, but you know, that's something that they might do. And so I worry that, uh, that an area like that might get hard hit again. That, that's my greatest concern. Um, but I think there's a good chance it won't happen. That's the best answer I have. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of jobs. Oh, I, you know, there's another thing. There's another thing about it. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, but we're going to replace those jobs with higher paying jobs. They're going to be repairing robots. Okay. That's, uh, that's disingenuous, right? <laughs> the whole point is to, make, to, to, make, to increase productivity, right? There's not going to be that many jobs repairing robots. If there were, you wouldn't be, <laughs> the robots wouldn't make sense, right? So, so that argument is, is, is disingenuous. But it is true that the jobs we're replacing are uh, not the most sought after jobs. And I, I think they can be rewarding uh, I've certainly met a lot of people in warehouses that find them rewarding and fulfilling, but a lot of people don't. And you see a lot of bad press about those jobs, especially sort of aimed at Amazon. Um, so uh, those jobs can be, for a lot of people, not, not that fulfilling. And, you know, the greater the pressure, the worse they get. I'll, I'll tell you, I even saw a patent once for a... Uh, an invention where somebody that's picking things out of a bucket and puts it into a cubby hole uh, you know, they have these things called put to light systems where you pick something up, you scan it, and the cubby hole lights up, and that's t what tells you where to put it. Okay, so if this isn't a human being turned into a robot, okay, well, it could be worse. Okay, this invention I saw the patent for was a thing that you put on your wrist, and if you start to put the thing in the wrong cubby hole, it buzzes you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, instantly I thought, of course, well, I wonder if they've written this patent broadly enough, because we could have the wrist thing shock them if they, if they put it in the wrong... Okay. Not funny, I guess. <laughs> having robots behave as robots is better than having people behave as robots. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about manipulation. Uh, let's think for a moment about what is manipulation. How would you define it? The easiest definition is it's what you do with your hands. In robotics, we want to move things not with your hands. We want to move things with robots and robot grippers and robot hands. Uh, so we have a broader definition, which might be moving stuff around to, uh, to cut the discussion rather short. It can go on a long time. What is logistics? Logistics is moving stuff around. It's the biggest manipulation problem of all. So all over the world, you have all these producers, and you have all these consumers, and the question is, how do you get all this stuff from the producers to the consumers? And the producers are consumers too, right? They take in stuff, and they make new stuff out of it. And so you've got this huge distribution network, and uh, how do you get all the stuff around? And so it's just a really, really big manipulation problem. Now, uh, let's see, in order to discuss it, I... Um, I thought we'd do an example of a mint. How do you get a mint out of a pack? This is not what a robot would do, but that's probably what any human would do. 
Um, OK, there's a mint. You wish you had a mint. You're uh, living in Atlanta, so what do you do? Um, you call up the mint factory and say, I want a mint. OK, uh, let's say the mint factory is in Minneapolis, because that's 1,000 miles away. Makes the math easier. Uh, factory guy says, no problem. I'll send you a mint. Hands the mint to a taxi cab driver and says, deliver that mint to Atlanta, OK? And be sure to get a check for $1,000 for your expenses and, you know, and a penny for our, our cost. OK, so uh, that's not what they're going to do, right? The answer to this problem is ride sharing. So the logistics network is just a big ride sharing scheme. OK, the, the, the mint goes you know, into a roll. So it's going to share the ride with all those mints. That mint is going to, that roll is going to go into a box. OK, there's a box of them. Did you bring mints for everybody? I did. I did. <laughs> I did. Better than that. Here, I'll show you my other prop. Sugarless gum, I think. <laughs> Um, and then this box goes into a case, okay, and, uh, and these things all share the ride. And now that mint is going through the distribution network, or it's going from hub to hub, from distribution center to distribution center, ultimately to the store, and then to you. And, uh, and when the system is working right, Every one of those trips is on a fully loaded truck, okay? It's sharing, it's, you're amortizing the cost of transportation across all of that stuff. And so when it gets to you now, incredibly, it can make that whole trip for less than three cents. And uh, it's actually similar to the airport uh, transportation, airline transportation. Uh, this analogy leads you in kind of interesting directions, right? If you're taking a long trip, you might go from hub to hub. Uh, you get on a plane, the plane goes to the next hub, you get off the plane, you sort yourself. Now, if it was a distribution center, the robot would grab you, pull you off the plane, and carry you to the next gate and, and put you into the next plane, right? But we don't have to do that, um, which means maybe we should do this with mints, right? What we need is intelligent mobile mints, <laughs> intelligent mobile edible robots, and you just tell them where to go. And uh, you don't need robots pulling them off trucks and putting them on trucks. I haven't patented that. You can, you can have that. Um, so one thing is it uses this progression of container sizes. So when you open a truck, you don't see a billion mints spilling out of the tailgate, right? You use this progression of containers. So a mint, a roll, a box, a case, a pallet. And you know, we don't think of pallets as containers, uh, but it's a kind of container. And we don't think of trucks as containers, but it's a container with wheels. It's a big box with wheels. It could be, you know, what people call a shipping container. And then that's even another level. And then the shipping container can go on a ship. So uh, there's several of these layers. And so now, uh, oh yeah, let's see. <laughs> yeah, when I was preparing the talk, I, I made this picture. And I thought this was keen. And then I thought, oh, yeah, wait a second. I don't know that much about logistics. I'll bet somebody's already made a picture like this. I went to my go-to source. And uh, sure enough, I now have to say, this picture is adapted from Warehouse and Distribution <laughs> Science by Bartholdi and Hackman. That's the, that's the figure in their uh, textbook. Um, they also identify a tier of a pallet as a, as a level. And there is specialized equipment for handling a, a whole tier of a pallet. Um, and they say, oh, and by the way, this is adapted from a Navy publication. So here's the Navy figure, uh, which is similar to theirs, except it goes all the way down to the individual piece. Uh, and we call these, uh, when you get down to the root level, we call that a piece or an each. And uh, they use paper clips, not mints. So that's my. That's my intellectual contribution to this. It works with mints, too. <laughs> OK, so we're going to follow a mint sort of schematically through the distribution network. They make a mint. They put the mint in a roll. They put the roll in a box, in a case, pallet, et cetera, OK? Put, 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 put. Now it's going to travel to a DC. Now when you think about it, what is sorting? Sorting is where you know it's you going from one gate to another. 
it's from uh, the, the FedEx uh, mail going from one truck into another truck. Okay, it's transportation. It's all it is is transportation, but uh, discretionary transportation, <laughs> transportation to different places, right? We sort ourselves because we're going to different places. So there are several trucks, and some of them are going to that DC, and some are going to that other DC, so it's, it's sorting. Okay, the truck gets to the first distribution center, pulls the pallet out of the truck, a pallet jack or a forklift pulls it out of the truck, a uh, vacuum system or a human being pulls the case off of the pallet. They sort these cases, <laughs> catching on here, they sort these cases, and then they put that uh, case on a new pallet, and they put that pallet in a new truck, okay? And now those, all the trucks that are there, they go to other distribution centers, so there's a sort operation. And now maybe this is the regional distribution center for the store, the grocery store. They pick the pallet off, they pick the case off, uh, they sort cases, and now this case is gonna go to a truck that's going right to the store. They don't always use pallets. Sometimes they just load cases directly in trucks, and that's what they do here. They put it in the truck. Truck goes to one of the stores. Uh, at that store, the workers uh, at the back of the store, they pull the case off the truck. They pull the box out of the case, and they put that case, one case, or one box in each of the uh, Cash register stations, whatever you call that, you know, right next to the cash register, which is where I bought these this morning. And, uh, and then they pick, pick, well, you. And then, okay, it's sitting there. And then you take this out of the box and you put it in your cart, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, you pull the mint out and you eat the mint, okay? And so if you think broadly, if you think sort of... Uh, in basic terms about what's going on. I mean, we have different words for all of these things. You know, we'll, we might be calling this, these different words if it's a truck versus a pallet or a case, but really it's all, you could call them all put operations. You can call all these pick operations, you call all these sort operations. And I'm not saying that's all that happens. There's all kinds of other stuff that happens. But as far as the sort of the basic operations of getting things around, there's an awful lot of it that's just, you know, pick, sort, put, pick, sort, put, pick, 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 Sort, 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 no, pick, 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 sort, put, 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 an awful lot of that. So now, um, again, looking at it very basically, there's, there's two things going on here which are very familiar manipulation challenges. And, and humans are all expert manipulators, right? You know a lot about manipulation. You don't necessarily think about it consciously very often. Uh, but if you, especially if you like shoot some video of yourself manipulating things and look at it in slow-mo, you'll be amazed at what's going on. It's very impressive stuff. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, when there are special challenges, I mean, we have a whole society of manipulation experts and we talk and, you know, we have words for these things. We have contests for these things too, right? And uh, uh, one bit of language that we use is that when you're talking about the nested containment problem, people will say, oh, it's like Russian dolls, right? That's a common phrase you hear from time to time. So, you know, that's like the iconic instance of the nested containment problem, I'll say. Um, and if you're worrying about, you know, how do you get one thing out of a densely packed case, and density is key in this whole thing, right? You, you want density, you want those trucks to be fully loaded. Um, so if you're trying to pick just one out of a densely packed array, that can be challenging, and when that's the case, we have this other iconic example, which is a cigar box. It's like getting the first cigar out of the cigar box. Maybe we need a new example, though. People don't smoke cigars so much anymore, do they? No. Sardines. Well, Sardines are an interesting one. If you really want it to come out intact, and I can't help telling you, my mother filleted the sardines out of the can. She, took the, she boned them. I thought, that's, that's a manipulation trick. Anyway, so there are those two iconic things. There's another iconic challenge that comes to mind, which is maybe the number one iconic manipulation challenge that people use, uh, threading a needle, okay? And, uh, and so 
I think it's interesting to look at logistics and see whether you see the threading the needle problem or not. Okay, so picking, packing, sorting. We're going to look at each of those just, just briefly. And uh, now, <laughs> picking, yes, it still works. <laughs> um, you know, this looks easy. How hard is it to, uh, you have something uh, and you have a gripper and you have something there and you go and you do this. How hard is that? Okay, so the first time I made the slide, I wrote easy there. Then I said to myself, wait a second, I and my colleagues have spent most of our careers <laughs> doing research on this problem. I better not say it's easy, <laughs> okay? So it's hard. <laughs> um, it looks easy there because, hey, that object is in a pose, that, that gripper is of a design that, that are a perfect match, okay? Uh, if that thing lying there were a credit card or, uh, let's say, a baby chick or, you know, there's a million things, and especially in logistics, literally, there's more than a million things, okay? And you don't know them all in advance. There's no way you can. Even Amazon doesn't know them all in advance. It seems like they could, but they don't. So, um, um, so actually, that turns out to be a hard problem. Um, when people wanted to think about clutter or make a problem a little bit more interesting, they would talk about the random bin picking problem, and that's this problem. And it used to be one that we talked about without much motivation, but suddenly it's very important because it happens all the time in logistics, okay? And so suddenly this is a very important problem, and it's as hard as this one, but even harder, okay? Because stuff's in the way. The other stuff, the walls of the bin, Okay, uh, that is a challenge. And then if we make the clutter just a little bit worse, now we're at the cigar box problem, okay? And how on earth is that robot gonna get that thing out of there? Yeah? Well, well you, the last one can be slightly easier than because if we can design like one solution just for that. If we can design one what? So like one solution just for the, let's say the cigar box, you could, uh, for a cigar box, uh, you know, for something to work so reliably, I don't know if anybody's ever done that with a robot, but I think you're right. I think you could. Um, yeah. How about converting the cigar box problem into the random bin problem? <laughs> By dumping them out. Yeah. Yeah. You dump them out. Um, I'm not going to dump these out. <laughs> but uh, right, and that's, that's called decanting. That's, that's, the, that's the term for it in the, in the trade. See, I have learned a little bit about logistics. <laughs> um, but you, know, you can't always do that, or there's a cost to it. And uh, building a robot that can do it, that's a challenge too. Yes, sir. Vacuum. Now, if you look at that first one again, um, you could look at this and say, yeah, the effectors, <laughs> the effectors designed for the object, looks like. Uh, that's right. In automated manufacturing, they very often design a different gripper for every object they're, that they're going to pick up. So, uh, uh, and you can't do that in, uh, in logistics. Um, there was another point which now I've lost. What, did, what was the remark? Oh, suction, yeah. Um, another thing about automated manufacturing is uh, despite the research community's disinterest in vacuum, vacuum is by far the dominant technology for picking things up in factories, and in every other application that I know of. I'm sure we can think of some where it's not true, but, it's, but vacuum dominates. And uh, I think vacuum's interesting. Most of the field seems not to think it's interesting, yes. Is it the formable end effector? Because how would they be able to go around to the tube as well as the flat envelope for vacuum? That's, that's a real problem. That is a real problem. Um, they do make uh, deformable you know, lips of the, of the cup 
Uh, pretty much they're all deformable. That's not quite right. Um, so yeah, go look at catalogs. Uh, PIAB, for example, P-I-A-B, and you will see a lot of interesting technology. Yeah, generally. I mean, you've, been, you've seen the scope of manipulation research. Why do you think vacuum end detectors were uh, underappreciated or ignored? I think people look at it and they just think, oh, that's too easy, that's cheating. And, and they also think, um, you know, that's not the future. Right, so the vision is they, they want to look to the time when robots have the same uh, intelligence and capabilities that humans do. And so they maybe even see being able to use an anthropomorphic hand as an important test of, of that intelligence. And so, I mean, that's true for all of us. You know, most of the research in my lab was also using fingers rather than vacuum. But there was some vacuum, and there still is some ongoing vacuum. I mean, one way of looking at vacuum is to say, uh, you know, you like fingers better than vacuum. Uh, that doesn't seem like uh, the right way to look at it. What if you had a finger that had a vacuum? And, and people have looked at this, including one of my students. Uh, you know, the difference is this. If you have a regular finger, the problem is that you can apply forces out, but you can't apply forces in. There's no adhesion forces. Uh, is it a bad idea to add vacuum and now you have adhesion forces as well? How can that be a bad idea? Okay, so, um, so vacuum is a good thing. And we'll see in a moment, in fact, the next slide. Um, so you saw the Berkshire Gray system picking up some envelopes and so forth. Check this out. So that loose bag, loose bags are a challenge because they make wrinkles and the wrinkles can defeat the seal. Um, see the, the gaps in that around the baseball there? Those gaps will defeat a seal and will defeat a uh, vacuum in most cases. And so what you're seeing here is that we've done some work on vacuum to try and address those problems. And uh, especially to pick up a bath sponge like that, obviously you're never going to get a seal. And, uh, um, and so I can't tell you, I can't go into details about what's going on here. But uh, vacuum can do a lot, and, uh, and we're using it a lot. Let's see, putting. That was picking, putting. I'm going to end at 12.30, right? Or, or, or earlier. Whenever you want. I think I'm good. OK. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, putting. OK, looks like the same as the, past, as the last figure, just with time reversed. And the key here is, Gravity is now helping you instead of hurting you, OK? So if you want to put something down in this simple case, uh, and if you're not worried about it getting damaged, you can just let go, OK? It's easy. Gravity does all the work. It's fantastic. So you don't do it with eggs. Uh, there's plenty of things you don't do it with. But with a lot of stuff, and especially, for instance, in, inside a FedEx shipping center, OK, you can let gravity do the work. Um, now, when you talk about a bin, this is getting a little bit harder. OK, but still, you can just let go unless you're worried about damage. You look at the third example. OK, that is insane squared. OK, there is no way. There's no way a robot's gonna, going to do that, at least the ones that we have now. Uh, now, you can look at that and say, well, he made it hard by holding that thing the wrong way. Well, the reason the robot's holding it that way was because it just picked it up, okay, off of the shelf. And being able to change the, the uh, pose of something in the hand is uh, way beyond the state of the art, okay? We've been working on it for 30, 40 years, but it is uh, not remotely a, sol a solved problem. So you could do this. Uh, and you wouldn't think it was hard. But if you really want to get some taste of it, what you should do is uh, you know, use one of these things, OK, and say, I'm going to you know, put a book on the bookshelf when there's no extra space you, using this. OK? And you'll be able to do it because you're a human and you're really smart. And you'll use all kinds of little cheats. But there's no way that a, that a robot can do that. So let me show you what's going on there. Uh, 
right now, state of the art is, uh, I think this is maybe the best example. So here it's, uh, this is like in the back of a grocery store and the robot's picking things out of the inventory bin on the right and putting them into bags on the left, which are the consumer is gonna pick up or it's gonna be delivered to the consumer. Now it's pausing right there and there's a little flash and so it's using a vision system to get a better estimate of the pose of the object in the hand. And then with that uh, precise estimate of pose in hand, it's able to put this thing in the bag uh, without crashing into the sides of the bag and without overfilling the bag. It can, you know, it has an idea of where the empty spaces are in the bag and so it can go for those. Um, it's not nearly as difficult as putting the last cigar in a cigar box or putting the book on the bookshelf, but it is doing some pretty impressive uh, placing. Yeah. Uh, you were just talking about in the bag, uh, when it places things in the bag, is it only deciding based on what it knows about the objects, how much space is taken up in the bag, or is it using like a camera or something like that to actively determine? Yeah, I, d I don't know the answer to that. Okay. You know, we have some systems that look at, at heaps of things and can t you know, figure out where things are. Whether we're using something like that here, I don't know. Um, here's another one. Uh, this one is an even more sort of uh, challenging situation. So it's doing the pose in hand perception again. And then now, look, it's not using gravity except for like the last tenth of an inch. So uh, it's a very carefully placing this thing uh, so it can't damage the product. And let's look at it again. Uh, let's look at it again. And you can see the tolerances are pretty tight here. There's not a big gap. So that's about, uh, I think, the best that you're going to see right now. Uh, sorting, well, like I said, sorting is just transportation, but, you know, discretionary transportation. Um, I don't have any interesting iconic instances of that, so let's look at another system. This is a, uh, a store replenishment system. So one of the things that happens is logistics is that, um, you know, stores sell you stuff, and then they need more stuff to replace it. They place an order to the regional distribution center. So now the regional distribution center is fulfilling the store orders. Uh, it's like e-commerce, except the consumer is the store, the retail store. Um, they can deliver things uh, not packed, uh, not, not with dunnage, it's called, not with the soft things to cushion it. You know, they don't put wrapping paper around it. Uh, you know, it's in uh, boxes. It's loosely packed in boxes. And they can just dump it in close up the box, don't really have to seal it, and, um, and then send it to the store and they reuse those boxes. Um, and so what this system does is store replenishment, it's taking inventory out of storage, uh, sorting that inventory to the boxes, and then those boxes are automatically flowing out toward, to the trucks. So uh, this is an overview of the whole system. There's, uh, these things are called linear sort wings. You saw one before in the FedEx uh, video. So there's four of them in this facility working side by side. So these are the inventory boxes uh, automatically being sorted to the different pick cells, the four different pick cells. Each pick cell, there is doing a tool change operation. It changes the size of the suction cup sometimes. Um, and it's putting them in, the, uh, in that bucket, that shuttle, that goes zooming back and forth and uh, drops things into the uh, containers, into the boxes. Uh, it doesn't need a, a scan tunnel, doesn't need the hyperscanner because it, it knows what's there. That, that bin has all the same thing. It's coming from inventory. And now it automatically kicks a box. When the box is full, it kicks it out the other boxes slide into place to close the box, and a new empty box slides in place at the end of the line. And of course, the software is taking, uh, keeping track of which box is where, so it can keep sorting things to the right box. 
And the box that got kicked out goes out and you know goes to a truck. Um, and you know, how many sort wings do you want? How long should the sort wings be? Why do you use a sort wing instead of a, a conveyor loop? These are all the things that I don't know about logistics, okay? <laughs> it's all statistics and uh, simulations. And the, the people that are, uh, uh, that are designing these systems, uh, they're working directly with the customers, looking at the statistics of that customer's particular business. How many different items do they have? What's the velocity of these items? How's that distributed? Uh, on and on and on to come up with the, the optimal arrangement. Uh, now, one thing about all of this, and I think this is a, a, a part of Wagner's vision which I didn't initially appreciate, but is very important for us as a business. We're selling the whole system. We could have said, you know, we're going to sell linear sort wings, or we could have said we're going to sell uh, vacuum cups, uh, but we're not. We want to sell whole systems. Sometimes we'll sell slightly smaller chunks, but mostly we sell whole systems. So why is that? Well, if you are confined to just fixing one thing out of a whole system, um, you, you just can't do as much, okay? If you can optimize the whole system at once, you get a lot more value. And the analogy I like is, uh, you know, put yourself in the place of Henry Ford. You're looking at all these horse and carriage systems roaming around, and you think maybe there's two options. Maybe I should automate the horse. Okay, I'll take the horse out and I'll put in a robot, and the robot will drag the carriage around. And, and this is what sometimes people in, some of our customers say, you know, they point to somebody that's picking up things here and putting them there, and they say, we'd like you to put a robot there. And we don't want to do that, okay? We want to look at the whole system and figure out, a, uh, you know, what's the right way to use the technology. So instead of building a, a robot and carriage, uh, we want to build a, an automobile. So the holistic approach. Uh, I'm going to show you one more system. So far, I haven't showed you any mobile robots. Uh, sometimes it turns out the best way to do all this sorting is with mobile robots. And so this is something we call a flex field. It's got a whole bunch of these flex bots. They automatically get things loaded on top of them. Um, they can store them on shelves. And you know, look at the horizon there. This field is huge. Um, and, uh, and so they'll leave things on shelves and they'll go back and get them later. The high velocity items, they'll leave them close to the robots. Of course, there's a huge traffic control problem here. Uh, all of these things, by the way, which you can learn in that excellent textbook free online. <laughs> um, so mostly these things are moving bins and boxes around in this example. And so the, the gray bins, and this is a store replenishment thing again. So the gray boxes are inventory. It's uh, the robots moving things from the gray bin, the inventory bin, into the store replenishment order bin, the, the brown bin, the brown box. And when that brown box is full, uh, it goes over to the place where it shoots out of the flex field and a human being puts it on a cart. Now, one of the beautiful things about this and again, this is, you know, it goes back to the holistic approach. If you look at the manual systems that they had before, okay, there's something they couldn't do, which was to put everything in the right order, okay? Uh, this system can put everything in the right order, and what that means is that, that the, the, the boxes, they're put on carts. Those carts are loaded into a truck. The truck goes to a store. Now, you pull the first cart off of that truck, and you can go right to the corner of the store, and you can just roll that cart up the aisle, taking things off in order. They're in the correct order to go right onto the aisles. And so they can unload a truck that way, and I, I forget, it's like an hour or two, okay? The old way, it could take them all day. You have this stuff coming off, it's not in the right order, things are stacked up in the back end of the store while they're getting things straightened out. Okay, it's a huge difference. Um, there's one more video to show you, and uh, I've been showing you videos without music, okay? This is, uh, you know, send, send you all off with a bang. This one has the music, I think. I don't know if you can hear the music. I don't hear the music. <laughs> but there's no music. Oh, what a shame. 
Um, so what this is about, this is a, a more recent uh, generation of the mobile robots. And what it's showing is that they don't just carry bins and boxes, they can carry eaches as well. So a lot of these things are things that are sometimes called big uglies, uh, things that uh, don't necessarily pack so well. And uh, <laughs> that, for example, I, I don't suppose they really send those to the stores like that. Anyway, that's just to show off that, that these uh, robots can, can do that. Um, I think that's the, is that the last one? Oh, no, it's not. Okay, I'm sorry. That wasn't the, the one, the, the last one. Uh, I just wanted to say a, a couple of words. I'll make it fast because I, I know I'm holding you all here a little bit longer. Um, what are the implications of this big new application? What are the implications for us in, in the research community? Uh, is it comparable to automated manufacturing? And uh, I don't know, only time will tell. But there's something that it shares with automated manufacturing, which I think is very important, uh, which is the path to, from research to application is much easier because the robots are already there. Okay, if you're in a factory, you know, if you invented something like a slightly better vacuum system or a better way to do motion planning, if it's relevant to factory operations, they can deploy it instantly because the hardware is already there. Okay, it's already set up for it. Uh, and th that is the case in logistics. If you say, well, I have a, a slight improvement to robot butlering, okay, that's going to have zero impact commercially because there aren't any robot butlers. Okay, somebody has to make, has to make this you know, huge advance to where robot butlers are viable at all commercially before any of this progress actually uh, gets applied. So it, it has that in common. And um, some other things, just more speculation about the possibilities. Uh, I, I do think it's certainly given me some different ideas about manipulation. I'm looking at clutter very differently than I used to. I used to think that the random sparsely populated bin was a high clutter situation. Now I think it's the, the, the Russian dolls of nested, densely packed arrays. Uh, somebody needs to make a Russian doll that's where each layer is a dense pack of little dolls instead of just one. Um, and then there's issues about funding. Um, you know, is there going to be an influx of funding in this area? It's, it certainly could be. I mean, uh, the, it's, it's, an imp it's economically important. Uh, it's important to the military, which is a source of a lot of funding in the U.S. And there's some public, uh, private funding already. Amazon's sponsoring a little bit of research, and so that might grow. I think maybe now, nope, not yet. <laughs> if you want to learn more, uh, the current issue of modern materials handling, this reveals another of our customers. So SoftBank Logistics is uh, trying to build lights out uh, warehouses in China, and they're using our system. So you see uh, a pixel behind those two SoftBank Logistics guys. Pixel is affectionately known as Cell 3003. Okay, here we go. One last video to go out with a bang. Okay, this is video is it has music, I think, and it's taken in our innovation center. So you'll see a lot of stuff you've seen. If you look closely, you'll see something you haven't seen yet. There it is. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it, that was a robot put wall. So So the Innovation Center is a big uh, warehouse-sized 
space in uh, a Berkshire Gray facility in Bedford, Mass. And so, you know, they have all those systems there to, uh, you know, customers bring in their parts, to their products to see if we can handle them and so forth. Um, so thanks, and I have time for questions. <laughs> I caught very little of that. I'm sorry. I think the mask and the distance. So, so I was saying that like, uh, the old VLO players, automation players, like Dematic. I know Dematic. Uh, Dematic. So, what, what is the distinguishing you from them, and why do you think that they cannot venture into your area? I mean, they will certainly try. Uh, the, the answer, you know, there's a few different answers. So. You won't see picking as good as what I'm showing you here. I don't think you'll see any systems that really compete with these. Now, uh, I can't really defend that statement, okay? How do we know? Uh, we don't know exactly what our competitors are doing. They don't invite us over <laughs> to have a look. Um, our customers see what they're doing, so a big retail chain will have essentially a bake-off, invite uh, our competitors as well as us to uh, show what we can do with their stuff. And then they come to us and they say, uh, you know, you guys were handling this percent and those guys were only handling this other percent. And, and so we get a little bit of information that way. Uh, I mean, the other reason to say, you know, where our, is our advantage, I think a big, big part of it is in the team the vision that Wagner had, the team, and I have a, you know, I'm prejudiced, but there's an awful lot of roboticists there. And, uh, and, and then, you know, we recruited people from robotics companies and we've recruited people from logistics companies. So we have expertise in all those areas, but the original team was primarily roboticists, people from uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, from Georgia Tech, University of Pennsylvania, uh, some from MIT, and, uh, and, and those people are awesome. <laughs> you know, they know how to build stuff. They know how to build machines that interact with the real world and how to build software that controls those machines. And uh, I don't, you know, it's going to be hard to match that. Charlie, yeah. It seems like you have this perspective potentially where you're seeing just a greater variety of objects and mechanical phenomena and just occurrences and manipulation than well anyone would in the lab. And, yeah. and I'm just curious if you've seen things that were unexpected or certain phenomena are more common or edge cases that you know, that kind of thing. Just the number of picks and the number of the diversity of objects. Yeah. Anything there? Um I mean, you're right. Um, one thing, uh, one thing is that, uh, you know, before, at times, I would say to myself, "Well, there sure are a lot of things in the world. <laughs> you know, we we want to be able to handle everything, but there's too many things to even contemplate, really." And then all of a sudden, you're in the business where you have to. That's that's part of the business, uh, and. So you start thinking like, how can I, uh, what's the right way to think about them? How do you organize things? How do you categorize them? Um, you know, but whatever progress we make along those lines, uh, some people would be unhappy <laughs> if I shared it, right? Oh, God. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's been my hope that the, the lessons I learned, I could take back to the lab at CMU. Um, I, I've done exactly one thing along those lines, which was to write a proposal about how do you pack and unpack dis densely dense arrays of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt that I could go there, uh, and and that's been about it. So, so the the flow of information is highly attenuated. Uh, of course, you know the best kind of technology transfer takes place in the heads of people, 
And so the thing to do for a lot of you would be, you know, to go spend some time working at one of these companies or, you know, or our company, and, um, and then take that knowledge back to the lab. Uh, there was a question here, and then I'll ask you. Yeah, so uh, it seems like a lot of the systems you showed, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that's required outside of just the robot itself. Um, and do you think that level of like structured closed work cell, like, do you think that's a temporary requirement, or do you think that you know we're kind of always going to be dealing with that realm? I think the time when it's when when it's temporary is is far off. I'll just say that. Um, I mean, these systems are very efficient. It's interesting what humans can do. I'll give you an example of something that humans do that uh, makes a difference, which is like, so let's say you've got two processes and, and there's a conveyor between them, and let's say the downstream process uh, gets hung up for a while. And so now boxes are coming down the conveyor with no place to go. So if the system's fully automated, you have to anticipate that and you have to have a buffer. Um, or be prepared to shut down the upstream process. But you don't have to worry about those kind of things so much with humans, because the humans, you don't even have to tell them. You don't have to train them or anything. The humans will start pulling the stuff off the conveyors and stacking it around in random places. And then when the downstream process starts working again, they'll go feed those back in, into, the, into the system. So, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of examples like that where greater flexibility would be uh, of, of value, but to the point that instead of uh, this super efficient fixed picking cell, we're going to have mobile general purpose robots, that's, uh, that's a long way away, I think. Uh, there was a question here, and I haven't been looking over that direction. I'll, I'll ask you next, okay. Yeah. So uh, the question is like, when you have developed a solution for a uh, distribution center, for example, and you move to another one, yeah. So when you are trying to develop a new solution for the uh, new distribution center, do you try to fit the technology that you have already developed or fit the solution that you have already developed for the previous one, or you approach it like, uh, you know, like you try to optimize for what is present in the new distribution center and try to develop a solution? Yeah. From scratch and from ground. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a choice there. And, uh, you know, you've identified a, an important choice. Uh, if we have the right technology, uh, and of course, in every solution, there's sort of reconfiguration, right? So, so you know, do you, do you go with, how often do you go with a whole new concept? Not that often, uh, but it happens. Uh, how often do you sell them something that looks exactly what you sold somebody else? As often as possible would be great, you know, <laughs> that's really wonderful. Um, not as often as we would like. And a lot of times you're taking existing products and, uh, uh, and using sort of the configuration variables to set it up for the next customer. So do you also consider the fact that like the solution that you're trying to develop for this customer would be applicable to some other Absolutely, case. yeah, absolutely, yeah, no. yeah. The business guys are all over that. <laughs> uh, there was a hand over there. A bit of a naive, like, logistics related question, but, like, we're talking about, like, the densely packed, like, configurations for some of them, and how, like, simple, like, manipulate like, things in and out of the distant packed configuration. I was thinking of, like, the example of, like, oranges, where, like, they're kind of spherical, so, like, the best, like, density packed configuration would be, like, exactly close packed. Which is nice because that's also like the lowest energy configuration, so they are just kind of naturally settled that their information. Why don't we just make more things into orange? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, what's the density of us of the optimal arrangement of spheres anyway? What's the percentage? Does anybody know? <laughs> it's got a pie in it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you could imagine that that, that would be uh, a, a useful idea. Uh, I can't figure out exactly where that would be the, the right idea. Uh, I, I think the right idea is 
uh, you know, rectangeloids, right? And because uh, uh, they can pack very much, very, very efficiently and kind of easy to build m handling equipment for and so forth. Uh, yes, yes, sir, and then you. So how do you deal with system failure? Is the, is, do you have anything autonomous that figures it out and can reset itself, or is the solution still person goes in, fixes yeah. the motor, person goes in, identifies failure? You know, system yeah. something's not working right, figure it out. Yeah, um, you know, both. Um, the, uh, I have a video, which I didn't show you, but, uh, you know, there's a video where this, Robots, you know, picking, pick, put, pick, put, and then it goes pick. It's like, huh, I didn't get it. Pick, didn't get it. Pick. What's going on? And then it lifts up, and there's a piece of trash. Okay, so there was some trash in the bin, which is pretty common. And, uh, and then it uses the, the vacuum system uh, in reverse, so to speak, and blows the trash out, you know, checks that it's got vacuum working, and then it goes back to work. So th there's an example where it does it autonomously. And, you know, there are other examples. You know, it's not hard. I mean, certainly there are failure cases. Um, I mean, if, not, if for no other reason than that sometimes what comes in isn't really the, you know, the best thing, something that it can handle. Uh, there was a question. Yes, sir. I was wondering what you see as the model that's been scaling up here. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can't answer the question that way because I don't really understand, you know, how many customers need what we've got versus how many have we reached. And so obviously a lot of our growth is going to be extending that. Uh, but there's the other side, which is, you know, different applications. Uh, so, you know, some of the things I've seen in warehouses, you know, when I, the first warehouse I went to with uh, Tom Wagner, the, uh, uh, there was a lady that was sorting things. And so, uh, you know, shoppers, pickers go through the aisles with their carts and they pick several orders at once, okay, and just throw them all in a bin in the, in the cart. Cart goes to the, uh, well, it is a bin actually. Bin goes to the sorter, and the sorter is now going to pull it out, scan it, and then put it in a, a cubby hole for the correct order. So she's sorting this. Uh, and the only thing was the bin was being crammed so tight, it was, it was maybe worse than a cigar box example. It was so tight that she would like grab something, go back and forth, and pull it out, you know, and then scan it. And I, I mean, I was very depressed. This was the first time I visited a warehouse, and I just looked at this and I thought, there's no way a robot is going to compete with this. We, just, you know, we can't do that. And I just, you know, I didn't have the perspective to step back and say, well, maybe it, maybe it can be useful without solving exactly that problem. But you see that over and over again. Uh, you know, another time, maybe even the second warehouse I go to, there's this huge pallet-sized box, and it's full of loose garments just absolutely loose. And people are pulling these garments out of this box, just like 10 people arrayed around the box, pulling things out of the box. And I don't remember they're folding them and putting them in plastic bags or putting them on hangers or what. But you know, again, it's like, whoops, uh, we're not doing that. Uh, and there's just a, there, there, there are a lot of jobs sort of in between those and the things that we're automating right now. There's just an awful lot of work. Uh, so there's that that manner of expansion and, and, and you know, where we're addressing uh, issues that we haven't addressed yet. Is, is that a follow-up? Let me give you an opportunity to stop, if you like. <laughs> uh, if you want to keep going. I don't mind. I love talking about this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, I, obviously anybody that needs to leave should leave. And I guess <laughs> people have figured that out. <laughs> yeah. Grab lunches on your way, too. I guess we're most familiar with six or seven degree of freedom arm. 
Uh, do you see any innovation happening to those that are doing this themselves, like branching into yeah. robotics? Or Oh, that's that's an interesting question. Yeah. So, uh, if there is anybody that, that doesn't know, one thing is happening in the manipulator uh, industry is that they want to make and, and are making a collaborative robots, which uh, won't hurt you. And uh, at least that's what we think. And uh, uh, and they tend to be slower. Not always. There's some that are still pretty quick, but they tend to be slower. Um, and we're not doing that, um, basically because we don't need to. Um, you know, would there be some tasks where we would need to? I don't know. But you asked a broader question, which is, you know, do I see changes happening? And I, I think that's probably coming. And I, I don't have any other ideas about that. But, uh, you know, those, those robots were designed, you know, in the context of where automated manufacturing was the key thing. And you know what do you want from an automated automated manufacturing robot? Well, uh, the way they looked at it is that you're going to put a tool on the flange of the arm, and so view that flange as a rigid body. You need to be able to control it in X, Y, Z uh, pitch roll, and if you can do that, you can control the, the tool that's at the end of it uh, in, in an arbitrary way. So that's kind of logic behind those industrial robots. Um, if you say logistics, is it still the same? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe you know it makes sense. Like for example, I mean, there are certain domains within automated manufacturing where they said, you know what, it doesn't really need to be three D. It can be sort of two and a half D, and we really only need four degrees of freedom. And so uh, maybe you know maybe there will be some innovations of that kind. You know, it's an interesting possibility. I think. Yeah, Sonia. Let's see. Obviously, we could have a long discussion of that. It's an interesting question. Uh, right now, I would say an awful lot of people think that it's vision, right? There's been a, so people who are working on bin picking right now, uh, or or at least a couple of years ago, uh, an awful lot of it was aimed at developing the vision systems using deep learning uh, to do the bin picking. To decide where would be the best place for the robot to apply its uh, gripper, um, they made a lot of progress, and then you know it's it's come a long way. Uh, is vision still uh, where the best opportunities are? Is that where you get the best bang for the buck? I don't know. It could be. Um, knowing what's happening is a big deal. I mean, there's an awful lot of things that we don't talk about that are very important, like you know, software architecture, system architecture. Uh, I mean, it's still the case that when you throw vision into the into the mix, you've got a problem, which is it introduces delays, and that's just not intuitive to us because it seems to us like our vision is instantaneous and doesn't involve delays. Now that turns out to be wrong if if, if you watch somebody. You know, sometimes you'll see somebody working in a kitchen, and and uh, and, if, and if you watch and record what they're doing second by second, it turns out a lot of the long pauses are for vision. But uh, uh, but still, it seems like there's opportunities there to speed things up. I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. I guess I don't have a very good answer to this, but I think it's a great question. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, there's nobody back there. It's, yeah. it's just you. I mean, this is a more general question. So you've been in this space where you, you've seen like robotics companies, you know, coming up in different areas and applications. So like uh, when, when they start out, do you think, or like how do you think like we should be trying to decide between, uh, when you're trying to develop a technological solution, how do you decide like, okay, this is some of the stuff that I can, uh, you know, do with the open source tools that are available to me. Like for example, let's say uh, ROS. Yeah, suppose you want to have a message passing architecture, yeah. So you could have ROS, or you could invest your intellectual time and effort to develop your own message passing architecture, which is like highly optimized. Right, so how do you think, this is one simple example. So like in your case, it might be some other thing that you could optimize for. So how do you reach that balance where you can, when you're de you know, trying to develop a reliable solution for a consumer, uh, for your customer? Uh, because open source technologies, they're not that reliable, yeah? So how do you reach that balance where like, okay, this is something that we can, you know, make do with using open source stuff? And yeah. something that we have to like develop like right from scratch and ground up. I don't know if that question was clear. Yeah. But I hope you get the gist of um, it. I mean, uh, you know, I would guess what we did uh, or what I would do. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, you want to get something working fast, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to use fast prototyping techniques. You're going to use solutions that are out there, you're going to use open source stuff, you're going to use these stacks, these, the raw stacks, you're going to use that stuff, uh, and you're going to get something going uh, aimed at, you know, what is your goal to, to demonstrate that you have, uh, that you can develop systems that address a need, uh, but you're going to go back, right, you're going to have to go back, right, so that's just a, uh, a first you know, proof of concept, a demo, prototype, right? And you're going to go back, basically, you're going to go back over and over again, all right? So by the time, uh, you know, before it gets to the product stage, uh, I mean, there's a whole raft of things there which I actually know nothing about. I don't even understand the job titles of the people, you know, some of, the, some of them anyway, the people that do that. And, uh, and so you're going back, basically cycling over and over again, kind of going through uh, hardening uh, where it needs to be hardened and uh, so forth. That's, that's the only answer I have for that. Just one last uh, question. Sure. So, yeah. uh, so there are like some companies like, for example, Gray Orange. I, I don't gray Orange, yeah. So, so they are also providing like warehouse automation solutions, but what I saw uh, was different from Berkshire Gray was that like uh, they also provide like a whole platform for you know giving you like metrics uh, regarding your warehouse like center like what's going on in real time they have like a really good UI and stuff so are you guys like focusing on that aspect of it as well like uh, providing like absolute metrics to the customer oh yeah absolutely so when they uh, when we start working with them they're giving us their uh, key performance indicators, KPIs. <laughs> These are the, 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 another thing I, I didn't know about. Uh, and absolutely, and you know, those are written, in, oftentimes they're written into the contracts that you're gonna be able to pick at so many pieces per hour, and uh, you know, the uptime is gonna be thus and such percentage, and yada, yada, yada. All that stuff is uh, very much a part of, of what we're doing. Yeah. And if you look at that uh, user interface we saw at the beginning, uh, I didn't see it then, but most of the time there's a running tally of the performance of the system on that user interface window. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot a basic rule of giving a presentation, which is don't forget to give them the opportunity to clap for you, right? <laughs> I blew it. <laughs>